9-11-01. A defining moment, I dare say, for all of us. I guess if you were a little kid, maybe not. But if you pay much attention to culture, even then, figure if you, 10 years ago, were six years old, you'd just be 16 today. So I don't know if you grasped all that then. Nonetheless, 9-11 reminds me of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And uh, a whole lot of us can remember that very clearly, right? Raise your hand if you can remember that very, very clearly. And I bet you, if I asked you, you could tell me where you were when you heard that he was shot. You can remember what you were doing. You can remember what that motorcade looked like. You can remember what Jackie was wearing. what the blood looked like, a hat. You remember the funeral procession with John John? I mean, all that stuff, right? Amen? It's just there. It's like it's etched forever in your brain and in your heart. And you have that sense that you'll carry it with you to your grave. Well, 9-11 was pretty much like that, wasn't it? You know, for Betty and me, uh, at that particular juncture, our son Jeff and his friend Ray had uh, gone to New York for vacation to enjoy time. They were in the World Trade Center on the 10th and were scheduled to have breakfast there on the 11th. And up in the, what is that called, windows of the world it was, that the restaurants, 106, 107 the floor. But instead of going, they decided to sleep in because they'd been walking around so much. And we got the call from them saying, something's going on here. A plane ran into one of the Twin Towers. Quick, turn on your TV. And it was early here. And uh, so, you know, we turned on the TV and just sat there in horror. just like everybody else. Now, I would like to be able to tell you that as a pastor, I felt completely differently about this than everybody else did. What a bunch of bunk that would be. You know, I felt the same sense of horror and fear and rage and uh, confusion that everybody else experienced, like you're just kind of walking in sand. What in the world is going on? And it took me a little bit of time, probably like it did for you, for my spirit and my flesh to get together, <laughs> for my head and my heart somehow to, to work on the same plane so that I could somehow grasp how God could be involved in any of this. And I had to work and work hard to control my anger and my desire for revenge. Brutal, quick, lethal revenge. Maybe it's a guy thing. I don't know. Any of you feel that way during those moments? you know, spillover of that time. Frankly, some folks are still there today. They've never moved past that. As a matter of fact, they, uh, every time they see imagery of 9-11, it's just like pouring gasoline on a smoldering fire. Boosh! And it just all comes back to life again, and they just get all the more angry and they're fixated on blame and on paybacks and what needs to happen how it needs to take place <clears throat> is that really God's heart is that God's 
best? Does that have anything to do with God at all? Don't you think it's possible that he has a whole lot more for us than that, a whole lot better than that? I've been giving this some thought, obviously, as we knew we were coming up to 9-11 and, and it was going to be on a Sunday. I've been thinking about this and I feel like the Lord really spoke to my heart very simple direction a word really for all of us and it's to be found in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians if you want to go with me to that scripture we're going to look just at a few verses that are there um, when you think about 9-11 if there's anything that should be clear to you it is this we have absolutely no idea what tomorrow holds none for that matter we have no idea what today holds the rest of the very day that is in front of us <clears throat> you know um, the question is how am I living my life for the Lord today how am I drawing close to the Lord how am I responding to the Lord how am I leaning into the Holy Spirit of the Lord how am I being directed by the Lord how tuned in am I to the things that God is putting on my plate today not yesterday or the day before but today who am I talking to about Jesus do you know by late morning 9-11-01 there were 3,000 people whose destiny was decided they would never have another chance again to get to that moment whatever they had decided they had already decided so who shared with them about the Lord who talked with them the day before or the day before that or the day before that or the day before that or did they have some well-meaning friends who were going to get around to it sometime you know I guess to state it as plainly as I can are you taking hold of the moments that God gives you right now to live for Jesus and if there's anything that he wants to say to us it has everything to do with that. Let me just read a couple verses here in Ephesians 5. These are the ones that need to set the pace, in my opinion, for our hearts and our minds. Ephesians 5, 15, Paul writes, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil, Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. To state the principle that we need to apply as succinctly as possible, just grab that first little phrase that exists there. You find it in the first part of the 16th verse, redeeming the time. That's what's going to help us make 9-11 more than just a memory more than just a bunch of video clips more than just footage of watching the planes come into the buildings over and over and over again you know we need to live fully for the Lord now now not after graduation not next year not next month not next week now we don't want to leave, live even a, a nanosecond of time slip by that we don't grab onto and squeeze for everything it has, life in Jesus Christ. Again, think about those folks in that tower, the ones who perish. They would never have another opportunity to hear about Jesus. And so you do think about all of the lives that could have impacted them before that day. There are people dying right now all around us, and they don't even know it. 
Who is it who is in their lives? Who has God put in their lives to be able to communicate to them the freedom and the fullness and the victory they have forever in Jesus Christ? You, that's who. And it is by means of that relationship through that and your love for him and your dependence upon him that they are going to have the opportunity to enter into the kingdom forever as well. But if that's going to happen, folks, you've got to redeem the time. Well, as I think about this and as I look at this, there are a couple of key things that jump out from this text to me. First and foremost, it is this. You want to walk carefully. Walk carefully. See then, he says, that you walk circumspectly. What he's telling us here, in short, is that we want to live each moment in such a way that we honor the Lord. And that's really all to be found in that phrase, walk circumspectly. Um, to walk, the word is peripateo in the Greek, it just means literally what you think it does, to put one foot in front of the other and move forward. But in this case, we're to walk putting one foot in front of the other following the Lord. <laughs> Not in any old direction, but to put what one foot in front of another and go after him. That means in every activity, in every encounter that we have with people, in everything we think, in everything we say, in everything we do, we are walking circumspectly after the Lord. Now, the temptation is always to do something else. The temptation is always to get distracted and not to keep following after him, but just to sort of veer off the path and go in a different direction, if not jog the other way altogether not even thinking about where that kind of thing might lead us. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is exactly what the enemy wants. He wants to distract us, to get us off our game. And as long as we're not following after the Lord, we're going to be moving in another direction, which is to say we're going to be moving away from him. And as, as we are moving away from him, that the enemy has us right where he wants us. You know, it's like with our reaction to 9-11. If we spend our time just fixated on anger and the hurt and the frustration and, and planning the payback and all the rest, who's, whose camp are we living in? Who in the world are we following after? Remember when Peter tried to cut off the head of the servant of the high priest there when they were arresting Jesus in the garden. Jesus said, put that sword away. The person who lives by the sword is going to die by the sword. What are you thinking? In other words, <laughs> how does that reflect me? How does that reflect my life? Everything I've come to say, everything I've come to do, that's not it. And so how in the world does it suddenly become it for us to go there? And I think that is always the challenge that we have in life, isn't it? You know, somebody says something nasty about you, so what do you do? Or you get laid off at your job, or you get canned, or who knows what happens. What do you do? How do you respond? How do you react? What does the character of Christ look like in your life? Do you just rage and moan and... and get caught up in anger and figure out what you can do to get back at this individual? Or do you draw near to Jesus and enable him to build in you even more than ever the peace that passes all understanding? Are you going to get distracted? Are you going to go where the enemy wants to take you? Or are you going to keep following after Jesus? Now, what he says here is to walk circumspectly. That word circumspectly is a very interesting word because it means to walk accurately or diligently or 
perfectly. Literally, it, the root of that comes from um, a word which means pointed. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Pointed. So it means to live a pointy kind of life. <laughs> We're pointed after Jesus. We are going to walk intentionally after him. And by intentionally, that means that I intend to do it, and therefore I'm going to do that in each of these areas of my life. And when my tendency is going to be to be distracted, I'm going to come back and stay right there where he wants me to be because that's where I'm pointed. I'm not pointed in any other direction. So we stay on our toes. We walk carefully, accurately, directly, pointedly in all that we say and do. The last thing that we want to be as he says here, is foolish. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Foolish simply means without wisdom. It's a-sophos, literally, without wisdom. If you don't follow the wisdom of the Lord, then you are a fool. <clears throat> you know, there's no reason for you or me ever to be foolish, none to be without wisdom. What is it it says? Go back in the first chapter of the book of James. And uh, what does he tell, tell us here in the fifth verse? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God, and he'll give it to you. It will be given to him. He doesn't say, ask him, and it might be given to him. He doesn't say, act him, and it could be given to him. He says, ask him, and it will be given to him. It will be. Uh, we have not because we ask not. You know, frankly, that's why we end up being fools, why we end up doing foolish things, because we really don't ask the Lord at all. We go off half-cocked and do stupid things, and then plead with the Lord to bail us out. When he gave us the wisdom right up front to avoid the situation to begin with. And so if we're going to walk carefully, that means by definition we're going to walk in the wisdom that the Lord gives to us. Now that's one of many reasons why we are so thankful that he's given us the word, the Bible. I often thought when it was a popular thing some years ago, remember that WWJD thing, what would Jesus do? What, what, what kind of question is that? What would Jesus do? Why don't you ask him? The question isn't what would he do? I don't know, I don't know, let me think about this. Ask him, he's alive, he's here. Look at his word, he tells you, it's not a big secret. <laughs> it's not some do 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 you know it's not one of those deals just go to his word and and look into his word and he's going to reveal it it's right there and if we don't end up following him we're going to end up being foolish when we walk circumspectly carefully not foolishly it shows up in our lives um, go back to the third chapter of the book of james couple different verses there in James 3 13 he says who's wise and understanding among you let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom or down in the 17th verse there but the wisdom that is from above is first of all pure and then it's peaceable gentle willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy Get this, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So when difficult things happen, we go to peace. We don't go to arguments, we don't go to fights, we don't go to meltdowns, paybacks, none of that stuff. Our lives are all about producing God's peace, nothing else. And that applies across the board. So as we reflect on 9-11, the question really for us is not, well, now, what's Homeland Security doing right now to make sure we're safe? I assume that somebody is asking and answering that question and questions related to those. 
the questions you and I need to ask are, how carefully are we walking for Jesus? With all of the distractions that exist in my life, and there are a million of them, how pointedly am I living for him? How am I taking every thought captive to Christ? How am I somehow honoring him in all of the things that I say and all the things that I do? I need to walk carefully. The second thing that is a key here is that we need to redeem the time. He goes on to say, redeeming um, the time because the days are evil. Doesn't take super heavy thinking to understand that we live in a horribly messed up world. And everything that I can think of, it's, it's messed up. This side of heaven, Satan is having a heyday. And he's leading people into destruction all the while, enabling them to think they're going to have a good time. I think you ought to go ahead and follow up on that affair. I mean, come on, look at your home life. He, she isn't responding to you at all. You don't really have the kind of relationship that you should have, and he, she doesn't care about you, blah, blah, blah. You know, all the self-talk, Satan talk at that point becomes. And uh, go ahead, just no big deal. It's not gonna, it, it, it'll add spice to your life, well, that's for sure. And uh, only it's not going to be the kind of spice you want. Go ahead and take that money from your employer there. Goodness, they got more than they need. Besides, you're underpaid anyway. You work long hours and they don't really realize how much you do for them and it's really yours just go ahead and and use it for yourself go ahead and cheat on that test. everybody cheats come on how do you think they get those a's they cheat right just look at the scores across the board they cheat so go ahead and cheat so you you follow the distraction right and what happens boom you get nailed and you got all the shame and all the remorse. And there's the accuser of the brethren accusing you. Look at what a rat he is. Look at what a rat she is. What a wretch. What a horrible life. Never can get out of this. Who in the world do they think they are? And they say that they're a Christian, right? See, that's why you want to capture this moment now for Jesus. And then the next moment, and then the next moment, and then the next moment, and the next moment. You don't worry about tomorrow. You got enough to worry about today. Tomorrow's going to take care of itself. Now is the time. Now is the acceptable day of salvation. Now is the day that we take hold of for Jesus Christ. You know, again, the words redeem and time are intriguing. Redeem means to buy up. It means to buy for your own use, to buy out, or to rescue from loss. That, to me, is one of the most interesting ones. And time just means a season or a time in which something is seasonable. You know, this is the season in which X, Y, or Z takes place. You put these things together and you realize that God wants you to buy for yourself to rescue from the evil one this very season for the Lord think 910 don't think 911 think 910 who was really grabbing that moment for Jesus take advantage absolutely ringing that thing out for the Lord who was doing that who is doing that today, this day, for Jesus? You, your friends, your family, your neighbors. Who in the world knows what tomorrow holds? So what are you doing today for Jesus? How are you rescuing today from the evil one? How are you purchasing today for the Lord? <clears throat> you know, the, the, the person who um, redeems the time, takes advantage of the time, is the person who doesn't allow any of the time of this day to get lost or to be ripped off or taken advantage of by the enemy. Just not going to let that happen. 
You're not going to just drift off. I thought about that at one particular epoch in my life. This has been a number of years ago. First time Betty and I ever went to uh, Sonora. Actually, it would end up being the thing that launched our ministry in Sonora, only we didn't understand that was going to happen. We just went down there for vacation. I had just needed some time. I was talking to one of the guys in the church, and he said, hey, I've got this condo down in this place called Keno Bay. Why don't you just go down and use my place? And, and I said, what's that? Or where's that? I'd never heard of it. And, oh, it's not bad. You can just fly through Phoenix and blah, blah. So we thought, wow, that's... All we need to do is get ourselves there. That'd be good. So we did. Very sleepy little fishing village. There were about 3,000 people in the whole area at the time. And uh, <clears throat> so we had been there, and we maybe the second day or so we were there, we walked down to a restaurant to have dinner. And it was kind of early, and, and uh, so they seated us right by the bar, but it was no big deal because there was basically nobody in the restaurant. And so there was a person working there and they didn't want to walk all over the place so we sat down we're looking at the menu and an older couple walks in walked right up to the bar sat down in order to drink I mean we were you know <clears throat> practically within spitting distance so we could hear everything was going on so they ordered a drink and it was obvious that this was a very normal natural common daily occurrence for them and they got all excited about the drinks that they had that were going to be coming as we're looking at our menu and ordering dinner well, they got their drink, and man, that thing hadn't even hardly hit the bar. Boom, it was down, and they had ordered a second round. I thought, whoa, where's this thing going? Well, you know where this thing is going. And uh, we were there through our dinner, and they are getting pretty sloshed. And uh, we finished, and we left. And as we were walking home, it just occurred to me what had taken place. You know, <laughs> these people were losing their lives one brain cell at a time, and they were paying the devil to kill him. Think about that. All the while thinking they were having a good time when they were slowly drinking themselves to death. Now, Next day or so, uh, we were nosing around the community just to, you know, try to figure out what's the Lord doing in this place, and I don't know if that's what you do, that's what I do, that's what we do, and uh, try to figure out what, what's up with the Lord and, and his activity in a place, and we ran across another couple, interesting couple. The uh, fellow had had a very successful business, successful enough that he retired before he was 60 years old, and uh, he said that he and his wife had decided that what they were going to do was going to buy a big boat and then spend a year or so sailing all over the world. And then after they were done sailing all over the world, they were going to decide what they wanted to do next. So that's what they set out to do. The problem was they couldn't buy a boat. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't buy the dumb boat. It's not that he didn't have the money. He had the money. It's not that he didn't know what he wanted. He did know what he wanted. But every time he got just next to buying it, something happened. He got sick, and so the transaction had to be put on hold, or a family member got sick, and they had to go someplace and help tend to somebody, or something started unraveling in the business deal sale, and so he had to he couldn't attend to it, and he had to work with the business thing, or the boat salesman moved, and so the, the task got shifted to somebody else, and he had to get up to speed. And I mean, this went on and on and on. And he said, finally, one night in the middle of the night, I could not sleep, and I woke my wife up, and I said, something is very wrong. I don't think we're supposed to buy a boat. <laughs> you think? <laughs> he said, maybe God is trying to tell us something. So they started seeking the Lord. And as they sought the Lord, they just had this sense that what he wanted them to do was to move to Sonora and to invest their lives helping people who had nothing. So that's what they did. 
they went down there to Kino and they bought a house and uh, he started driving around out in these little villages where there were a hundred or so people living in these shacks with dirt floors had absolutely nothing and he would do whatever he could do to make life a little bit easier for them in the name of Jesus and he'd talk with them about the Lord every chance he had the opportunity and you know people friends of his and so forth heard about what he and his wife were doing and so they'd start sending you know a hundred bucks down but it was always more than a hundred bucks that got spent because Roy would see what the need was and and maybe it just took a little more money and so he'd add so I mean he didn't he had money saved for a boat and uh, so he would go ahead and and put that in and pretty soon he got to the point where he was actually he said busier than he had been in his whole business and he couldn't be more excited about it. so he invited us to tag along with him so one morning Betty and I got up and we went over to his place and got in his four-wheel rig and it took us about an hour to get out to where we were going driving over dirt ruts and one thing and another to get there <clears throat> and the whole point of this trip was to deliver one prescription to an elderly lady who needed this prescription. She couldn't afford it. She had no means to get to where it was. He drove into Hermosillo, took the hour trip to get in there, get the prescription, come back, and then we went out with him, and he delivered it to her, and it was would have been an hour back with powder dust that coats everything. And uh, But, of course, it didn't take just an hour because he could never just come straight back. He had to go to every one of these little villages and share and talk and, and encourage and do the stuff that only he could do. Now, I want you just to think about for a moment why would a guy on a day when he could be out in the Sea of Cortez catching yellowfin which is what virtually all of his peers were doing in that place. Why in the world would he give up that kind of time, that kind of money, to help people that couldn't care less about him? i tell you why. Because he was redeeming every moment he had for Jesus. Talk about wringing it out. This guy had taken hold of those days by the throat, and day after day after day, he was laying it down for the Lord. What an incredible blessing. Now, you tell me. Got two different kinds of people here. Who is going to get the most out of life? The one who is drinking and smoking their lives away? literally or the ones who are working hard but just couldn't be happier in what they're doing who do you think at the end of the day is just excited about tomorrow and what it might hold and who do you think gets up and says wow I am just so excited about what I get to do today. And who, on the other hand, do you think just kind of floats along with whatever and numbs themselves down so that they don't have to think about the day? Who do you think is going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter the joy of my Lord? Who do you think sleeps like a baby at night, thrilled about what he and his wife get the joy of being able to do? This last week, we have been reminded of a tragedy of epic proportion. It hit us as a nation hard, and we have one of two choices. We can get mad just thinking about it. We can continue to be in pain and frustration and we can get hostile. Or we can realize this is a wake-up call. 
This is a wake-up call for you and me to use whatever time we have for Jesus. Folks, you and I have no concept of what is before us. But right now, we know where we are, and we know who we know and what he's about. It's not a secret. And we know that he wants to work miraculous things and bring life through all of his people ongoing. We live in a community that is filled with people who are dying and they don't even know it. And he's put us here for a reason. What is that reason? To bring new life in Jesus Christ. To help people to know that they don't have to be trapped in that bondage of sin and aimlessness anymore. They don't have to be locked into confusion and meltdown and anger and frustration. They can be free, really free. But much more than that, they can know that they're going to spend eternity rejoicing eternity with all of those who have ever put their faith in Jesus Christ. You can't put a price tag on that. What is the word that God has for us in the wake of 9-11? See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And all God's people said, Amen. Lord, we do want 9-11 to be more than a memory. <clears throat> we see all the images and hear the reports of all the stuff that took place. Just tears at our hearts one more time. But Lord, I would pray that it could be so much more than that for us. I'd pray that truly we would hear you as you speak. The very word that you gave to me this morning for one who is a part of our fellowship. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. That's really what you're about in our lives, Lord. It's not about death. It's about life. It's not about what was. It's about what is and will be. We are so thankful for what was on the cross because we realize, is that, we realize that changes completely what is and what will be. Lord, just to think that as we learned here again a few weeks ago that you have poured such treasure into us, earthen vessels, cracked pots. Sometimes we feel as though, wow, we really don't have the ability to say the right words or do the right thing or, or, or. And Lord, all that is is a big distraction. It's not about us, it's about you. And you've said that you'll supply us the words when we need them. You'll give us everything we need. Lord, I just pray that we would hear your voice as you speak and we would not only walk carefully, but we would rescue from the evil one and purchase for you every moment of every day. Lord, help us not to get distracted. Fill us afresh with your spirit, with your joy and enable us to bring your peace. There are among us here today, Lord, some who have never put their faith in Jesus Christ. They've never walked through that door, and he is that door to gain life. And there is no other way to get there. 
There's no other way to get past that bondage of sin. There's no other way to get out of the confusion. There's no other way to get loft in life but through Jesus. And Lord, you've brought them here today that they might find life, that they might find peace, that they might find health as they put their faith in him. As we remain in prayer together right now, if you are one who desires to put your faith in Jesus Christ here today, would you just raise up your hand for a moment? Raise it up. I want to be in prayer with you. God bless you. I got you. God bless you. God bless you. Raise it up high enough that I can see you. Will you get my attention, especially if you're in the back? I got you. Wow, way back. Okay, got you. Others? All right, Lord, we thank you for those here today who are indicating that they desire to have that life. Thank you for the fact that as they're willing to confess you before men, you have promised that you will confess them before the Father in heaven. They will have life in you. They will have it here this day. Old things will be passed away. All things will become brand new here today. Thank you. And thank you, Lord, that we can lay our burdens down at your feet, that we can seek you about anything that is going on in our lives because you answer prayer. We praise you for this day, Lord. We praise you for the things that you have in store for us. Lead us, guide us. Help us to hear your voice, Lord, as you speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen.